너무 좋다. 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 너무 So we have three main subsectors. We have the money and capital markets. Capital is just like similar to money, okay? We have the banking market, bond market, and equity market. So in equity, we have stocks, right? So people want to get loans and deposit money in different countries, right? Where does Kim Jong-un keep his money? Where does he do his banking? It's probably in Switzerland, right? He went there to study too, right? So then we have the bond markets. I want to sell bonds to foreign investors, or I want to buy a bond in another country. And the stock markets. My company wants to sell the stock to foreign investors, or I want to buy stocks in another country. Uh, Samsung, for example, sells stock on the New York Stock Exchange, right? And then we have the foreign exchange market, which is the biggest market, currency market, okay? It's bigger than the stock or bond market uh, that you're using now on the one of trading. And then we have derivatives markets. Derivative markets, derivative means something based on something else, okay? We have derivatives in maths. There, it's something that's based on something else. It's not its own thing. Something else is underneath. Okay? So we have, we'll talk about later in the course, forward futures and options. You won't understand that now unless you studied before. But we'll talk about that later in the course. So anyway, this course is more fo focused on the or this, this part of the course, this, uh, we're talking about foreign exchange regimes, okay? So we're going to focus on this lecture, this class on the foreign exchange market that you guys are already uh, studying. So we already discussed, we'll split the course into three parts, right? This is the first part we're talking about the foreign exchange uh, and exchange rate regimes. So, do you understand the word regime? Regime, what's another word for regime in English? System, system right? So really this is exchange rate system. So this is the arrangement by which the price of one country's currency is determined within the foreign exchange market. So how is my price of my exchange rate decided? Is it decided by just supply and demand? Or is it decided by the government intervening? So sometimes the government interferes, right? And they control. Do you understand interfere? Right? So they can control or try to control the exchange rate. Sometimes they're not successful and they have currency prices. So the foreign currency price is the exchange rate. We say the spot rate, today's exchange rate. And then we use the value of your currency as a ratio of another currency. So one is two, whatever. Which dollar, which currency is used usually? Dollar, right? When we're looking at the exchange rate, it's usually against the dollar that we say. So since the 1940s, after the Second World War, there was a meeting, and the British economist, Keynes, he wanted to make a global currency, uh, like a reserve currency. But basically, the Americans said to him, do you want some loans to rebuild Britain? And he said, yes. And they said, well, then the dollar is going to be the reserve currency. And he said, OK. <laughs> That's to sum up the negotiation. So the Americans were very generous to Europe and helped it to be built. But one of the things they got in return is the US dollar became the reserve currency in the world. 
which is a kind of privilege. These days, the euro is starting to challenge the US dollar a little bit. Okay? But, uh, before that, there was gold. There was the gold standard. All of the currencies were priced in gold. Okay? And we had a fixed exchange rate system in the world. So the price of gold stayed the same. And then, even after 1940, the price of gold stayed the same against the US dollar until 1970. So one guy went to the dentist and he had to get the gold filling, right? And he had to pay $20 for the gold filling. And then 40 years later, he went to the dentist and he had to get a gold filling and it was still $20. He asked the dentist, why didn't you increase the price of the filling? The dentist said, didn't you know the dollar and gold is fixed, right? So it used to be that the dollar was fixed to the gold. But during the 70s, the, the, they had a war with Vietnam, and there was a big problem with the oil price. So basically, the other countries didn't think that the US had enough gold. Because it was supposed to be, if you gave them the dollars, they would give you the gold, right? So the US left the gold standard, and the US dollar just floats against gold. Right? When the US left the gold standard, the price was about $32 for one ounce of gold, but now it's about $1,200 for one ounce of gold, right? about 30 or 40 years later. Would you prefer to have had gold or US dollars? <coughs> right? So uh, these days, it used to be the currencies were based on gold. Right? And then go through the US dollar. And then now, just mainly the US dollar is the reserve currency. Right? That's, not, that's just floating, not based on gold anymore. <coughs> so we can quote the foreign exchange rate in two ways, American terms and U European terms. So it's a little bit confusing, because the way you think it is, it's the opposite. So American terms express the exchange rate as the amount of US dollars for one unit of foreign currency. So it's 165 for one British pound. So American terms, here we have usually euro, right? Or pound. Okay, on the left. And then we have the US dollar on the right. That is American terms. Okay? European terms, the US dollar is on the left. So it's confusing. When the, Euro, when the US dollar is on the left, it's European terms. When the US dollar is on the right, it's American terms. Okay, so we have that kind of thing. Then for the one, the US dollar is on the left. Okay? Or for the ruble, how many one is one dollar? Okay? And how many ruble is in the, on to one dollar? So this is what's this? American terms or European terms? It looks like American because the US dollar is on the left. That's what's confusing. What is this one? This is European terms. Okay, that's the confusing thing. Can you remember that? American terms is when the US dollar is on the right. Okay. This is American terms. This is European terms. Is there any European country here? Russia, but not Korea, right? So anyway, we use just this title, whether there's a European country or not. <clears throat> so European terms express the exchange rate as the amount of foreign currency per one US dollar. 76 yen per one US dollar, 7.8 Hong Kong dollars per one US dollar, 6.381 per one US dollar. So for reporting and trading purposes, most of the world's currencies are traded uh, against the, uh, with the US dollar on the left, right? So we can see US and Cana Canadian dollar here, American currencies, all of them is US dollar on the left, right? US Canada, US Mexico, Brazil, European and Middle East, 
Euro, just the euro and the Great British Pound are on the left. The rest is all US on the left. Okay. Asia, Asia Pacific. The Australian dollar is now uh, on the other side, right? But you can see the Japanese, Hong Kong, and Singapore <coughs> currencies have all uh, changed. So generally, the currency which is stronger, we put on this side, right? And then that will be American terms. If the US dollar is the weaker currency, but if the US dollar is the stronger currency, then we're going to have the European terms. And generally, that's the case. Generally, the US dollar is the stronger currency. So we just talked about the main markets that the world is divided into. Can you remember what were the main markets we said? The main markets in the international monetary system, or the main sections. We had the money and capital markets, foreign exchange markets, and derivative markets. Why? Inside the money and capital markets, we have banking, bond, and equity. So if we go back to the uh, internet, we can see here in markets, right? Stocks, stock market, currencies, the foreign exchange market. Okay. Commodities, we didn't see mentioned there. Energy, oil, and so on. Bond markets, okay? So, the, these business websites are also based on, on uh, markets. <coughs> so let's talk about exchange rate regime. So, our system. So we can think about the exchange rate system as falling along a spectrum, as represented by the government's involving, involvement in managing the exchange rate. So basically, is the government involved in managing the exchange rate? How much is the government involved in managing the exchange rate? That tells us about your system. No involvement by the government. Market forces determine the exchange rate. Okay. Supply and demand. Do you understand supply and demand? Market forces. People want to buy, people want to sell. Then, very active involvement by the government. The government is managing the exchange rate. And then, most countries are going to be long here. Even Japan, which is supposedly a free floating currency, right? Their government is bullying their central bank to do monetary easing and getting kind of getting involved in the market. Okay? So Japan is not going to be zero involvement. It's going to be a little bit here. Right? On the other hand, we have countries which try to keep the exchange rate like Hong Kong. Hong Kong's always 7.8 Hong Kong dollars is one US dollar. Right? So the government is always keeping the Hong Kong dollar the same as the US dollar. So every day they are buying and selling US dollars to keep their currency at the same exchange rate. Very busy. So basically, we could we could uh, do this line. How busy are central banks, right, in getting involved in the currency market? Hong Kong central bank every day involved in buying and selling currencies. Okay. Other countries not so busy. So we have different different regimes. Different system. So instead of saying no involvement by the government, it's better to say minimal, small, very small involvement by the government. Okay? Market forces are, are determining the exchange rate. Active involvement by the government, the government is managing the exchange rate. So the name we have for this one is floating exchange rate. The name we have for this one is managed. Because the government is managing it, so we call it a managed one. Floating, if you drop a plastic bag into the water, did you ever put a plastic bag into the river, just for fun? Because you're not supposed to, no? But if you put a plastic bag in the river, 
What's going to happen to the plastic bag? Where is it going to go? Hmm? You're not really sure, right? You're not really sure where the plastic bag is going to go. It's just floating on the river. It could go anywhere. Okay? So it could get caught on the bank. It could go around in a circle. It could go anywhere. So that's a floating exchange rate. It's not being controlled. It's not being managed. It just moves with the market. The water is like the market, right? Then managed exchange rate means somebody is managing. Somebody has a plastic bag. They're pulling the plastic bag around, right? Not a very good image, but anyway, they're managing where the bag goes with a stick, right? So the government is managing things, managed regime. Government is not floating regime. Okay, pegged exchange rate. Do you understand the peg on the clothesline? Do you hang up your clothes, or does your mother hang up your clothes? <laughs> do you hang up your clothes? You do. Yes. Okay. So you use pe do you use a peg or a hanger? Peg is just keeping the clothes on the line. I'm very good at art. <laughs> The peg is just on the line, you just have a thing which just keeps the clothes on the line. So the clothes doesn't move. Okay? Do you use pegs? You use hangers, right? Korean people use hangers, but we usually use pegs in Ireland and England. Hangers is probably better. I think generally Korean people know how to do things better. They also fold their towels better, clean their house better, a little bit more efficient. But we use pegs, we have to take off and put on all the pegs every time. We're not that smart, right? <laughs> you can put on the hanger and then you can just take and put on the thing. So now I use hangers. But my mother still uses pegs. <laughs> so Koreans are too smart to use pegs. Maybe you can start using hangers too. You use hangers already, already the idea spread to Russia. So <laughs> if you use peg, the clothes doesn't move, it stays in the same place. You're keeping it in the same place. So that's what Hong Kong is doing. They have a pegged exchange rate. They're keeping their currency in the same place, always around eight Hong Kong dollars is one US dollar, right? So Hong Kong is keeping it pegged at eight. It's not, it's not moving up or down. It's pegged in the same place. Also called fixed, fix something in the same place. So here is some classification of the exchange rate regime. Floating regime, no or very little government involvement in the foreign exchange market. So the government is not buying or selling their currency or the other currency in the market. Demand and supply is the main determinant of the exchange rate. So we're talking about who? Global banks, we mentioned earlier, banks, investment funds, Multinational companies, speculators, hedge funds, exporters, importers. On this, on this list, who doesn't need to buy currencies? Who's the, there's only one group here that don't need to buy foreign currencies. Who are they? They don't have to buy foreign currencies, but they only do it because they want to make a profit. Speculators, right? Other people have to do this as their day to day business. Do banks have a choice about buying foreign currencies? Not much, right? You need a foreign currency for your holidays. The bank has to buy it, give it to you, okay? Uh, companies, they trade with a foreign currency. Country, they have to buy the foreign currency. Exporters, importers, right? Investment funds, if your, your client wants to buy stocks in another country, you have to have the currency to pay for the stock. Okay? But speculators actually make up most of the market, even though they don't need the money. Okay? So you have a lot of people who are doing speculation every day on the currency market, trying to make profit. So <coughs> central banks might intervene occasionally to offset what they regard as inappropriate or disorderly exchange rate levels. So we have all these guys buying and selling the currency. We'll talk about later. If the speculator has a lot of money, 
they can cause a problem for the country, right? Uh, so the government might come in. An example is in Japan when there was the earthquake, okay? The Japanese yen got too strong because people were taking their money back to Japan. Japanese people like to invest in other countries. We saw in the last class the interest rate is very low in Japan, okay? So Japanese people like to invest their money in other countries. So when there was the earthquake in Japan, because of the instability, a lot of Japan people took their money back to Japan. Were they buying or selling Japanese yen? They want to take their money back to Japan. Their money is in Indonesian or Korean won or dollars. Do they want to buy yen or, or sell yen? Buy, right? They're taking their money back to Japan. Uh, at the same time, Japan had some problem with the earthquake. Are you going to sell your stocks in Japan or buy stocks in Japan? Maybe you, if you, people think about profit, they might think I should support Japan and leave my stocks there. But most people will think about money. They might want to sell. So anyway, we have the this supply and demand situation. But the Japanese take people taking their money back was much stronger. So the Japanese yen was getting very, very strong. What's the problem for Japan if the Japanese yen gets very strong? Japan exports a lot of things, right? Toyota, Sony, so on. Okay? If the yen is very strong, then those their product is going to be very expensive for foreigners to buy. Do you understand that idea? Say that we have 50 yen is one dollar, or we have 100 yen is one dollar. So I make a, I make a Sony walk, Walkman. It costs 100 yen. It costs me in America. It costs 100 dollars, right? No. And the yen is 50 yen. So that means it's cost costing me 5,000 yen. Okay. So this is one. And then number two, the yen gets one dollar is a hundred yen. So now we, it still costs me five thousand yen to make a Sony Walkman because I have to pay the salaries and materials in Japanese yen. Okay? How much does that cost in, in, in uh, US dollars now? Fifty dollars? Yes. Yes, right? A hundred yen is one dollar. Five thousand yen? Fifty dollars. Okay? So what happened? Here the yen is strong. This is a strong yen. Okay? Here is a weak yen. Okay? Strong yen, with 50 yen I can get one dollar. Weak yen, to buy one dollar I need a hundred yen. Okay? So with the weak yen, I can sell my product, it's cheaper in the US. Okay? So Toyota, Sony, all those companies will do better. So if you have this problem with the strong yen, here, the Japanese economy has a problem. Okay? So the government decides to intervene, and what are they going to do? Are the government going to buy yen or sell yen? They're going to sell yen, right? The central bank is going to sell yen. So actually what happened there was the other central banks decided to help Japan. So the, the American and the, Europe, the European and the British central bank, they all said, we're going to sell yen too. Okay? So it was coordinated action by different central banks to intervene in the, in the market. So this is not, a floating currency regime is not never intervene in the market, okay? Just occasional, occasional or rare intervention in the, mar in the foreign exchange market. So <clears throat> the next one is the managed currency. So there is a high degree of intervention by the government on a daily basis. So we can see the difference here, right, every day. Their purpose is to offset the market forces and produce a desirable exchange rate level or path. What they want the exchange rate to be. Okay? So in order to do this, you need to have a lot of dollars and euros and gold. Otherwise you can't do that. 
Okay, because what you're going to do is you're going to use the dollars to buy your own currency if you need to. Okay, and you're going to sell your currency. So that's one reason why Hong Kong can do that. Because Hong Kong has a lot of US dollars. Okay, Hong Kong does a lot of trading. They get a lot of US dollars, they have a lot of savings. So they can use that, those US dollars, for buying and selling their own currency. China can also do that. They have a lot of savings of US dollars. So it's usually done because the exchange rate is seen as important to the national economy. Okay, so usually we're talking about emerging economies. What kind of industry is important in emerging economies? So for example, in Russia, what are the most important industries? Oil. 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 Anything yeah. else? Yes. Yeah. Gas. Other things? How is it called in general? In general, how is it? Energy. Yeah, energy. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Do you have a lot of raw materials? Wood? Wood, yeah. Timber or wood. Okay. So the exchange rate is important to those kind of things. Okay. Uh, also, for those in the export sector, if you look at China, China is importing a lot of good, exporting a lot of goods, which price is very price sensitive. You're very price sensitive about those goods. For example, clothes, right? Am I going to buy the jeans which was made in China? Maybe if it's cheaper. If it's the same price, am I going to buy the jeans made in China? Or the ones made in Italy? Which one, am I go which one are you going to buy? Jeans made in China or Italy? Italy. So the exchange rate is important for China. Okay? If their exchange rate gets too strong, the type of goods that they're selling is quite it's price sensitive and they won't sell them as well, okay? Many, these days, many things in the world are made in China. So if you buy a plastic bowl for your dinner, right? It could be made in China, it's very cheap, you buy that, okay? If the price of the plastic bowl goes up by just $2, you might not buy that plastic bowl. You might buy one which is made in Korea, okay? So, <laughs> the reason they're doing this is that the exchange rate is important for the national economy. Uh, for example, these exports or imports. So the currency's exchange rate will be managed in relation to another currency. Preferred currencies is the US dollar and the euro. Here we can see a basket. So do you understand basket? Where do you use a basket? In Costco, you put a lot of different things in the basket, right? So here's a basket when you go shopping. We're talking about shopping basket, okay? So here we're going to put currencies, US dollar, euro, okay? Yen, Great British Pound. They're the main currencies. So Singapore, it, it, it uh, puts its currency is against the basket of currencies. It manages its currency against this, all these currencies. What is in the basket? It's a secret. China also has the same. Okay? Usually, whoever you do more trade with is going to be bigger in the basket. So China does a lot of trade with the US. So they're managing their currency mainly against the US dollar. Right? For, US dollar is going to be the main one in, in most baskets. Then the euro. For China, the euro and the yen might be similar, right? China does a lot of trade with Japan and Great Britain. So what they're doing is they're managing their, the value of their currency against these currencies, the dollar being the most important one. <coughs> so what about the fixed exchange rate? So the managed exchange rate, they allow the currency to move, but very slowly. 
fixed exchange rate, they don't let the currency move. Okay? So every day it can just go up or down one uh, one percent. The government don't want the market forces to determine the exchange rate. The exchange rate is essential to the country's economic development and trade relationships. What is special about Hong Kong? What kind of industry does Hong Kong have? Tourist? Where do you think Hong Kong gets most of its money from? What kind of industry? Banks? Financial area, right? In order to be a financial center, you need to have a stable currency. Okay? Could you be a financial center if your currency is changing all the time like this? Going up and down? Are people going to use your country as a financial center? No. No. Why? Because they keep changing the money into your currency and it changes from one day to the next. So Hong Kong wants the financial center is important, so they want to have a very stable exchange rate. Okay? So they link it to the US dollar, the main currency in the world, and it stays always the same. So it's one advantage Hong Kong has for being financial center. Okay? Exchange rate is very stable. Uh, so, for example, when Ireland entered the euro, euro is also a fixed exchange rate, right? Ireland's financial centers start to improve, start to increase. Maybe it got too big because uh, investors didn't have to worry about Ireland's currency changing anymore, right? It's now using the euro, so much more stable currency. So. Governments are also concerned about the potential negative impacts of an open capital market. Hot money coming in and out of their country. So here we can have some different countries. So who are using the floating rate? So we can see these countries are using the floating rate. Some of them more floating than others, right? So mainly the ones you can see on a WANDA are more the most uh, free floating currency, right? We didn't see the one on one there, right? We didn't see the Thai baht or the Brazilian real. Okay, there is still some restriction. The government still has some restriction on trading those currencies. Here we have the managed currencies. Okay, and then we have peg, some peg currencies. <coughs> so. Why do you think Saudi Arabia has a pegged currency? Oil, right? Saudi Arabia is selling oil in dollars. So, uh, they're selling oil in dollars on the world market. People are buying in dollars. So they want to have their currency the same as dollars, basically. Their currency is linked to the dollar. So that uh, the income on oil is a little bit more stable. It's not depending on their own exchange rate too much. Okay. So also Saudi Arabia. I said that countries who have a lot of dollars can do that kind of thing. We'll talk about it later. Uh, speculators. Speculators can attack and put pressure on a country. But if you have a lot of dollars, like Saudi Arabia or Hong Kong, speculators are not going to attack you. Okay. <coughs> so. Uh, this is exchange rate systems can change. When exchange rate systems change, it's usually caused caused by some crisis situation, and it can cause some crisis situation. So uh, we can see here, uh, 1970 to 2010, and uh, this is by the number of countries. How many countries are using floating? and how many countries are using fixed, and how many countries are intermediate. So the total should be 100%. So we can see in 1970, every country was using a fixed exchange rate, right? The US dollar was fixed to gold, and the countries were fixed to the US dollar. Okay? So the price of gold wasn't changing. But then we came off that system, and here we start to get these number of countries. The number of countries is not that high, right? The GDP is higher in those countries. This is by GDP. So like the US and Japan, that's only two countries, but very 
high percentage of GDP in the world, right? Maybe GDP is more accurate. So about 50% of the world's GDP is in the countries with the floating currency. Managed currency in the middle is, is the second biggest. And fixed currency is not that big. Okay? If we look at the number of countries, we can see that recently some more countries came back to the fixed exchange rate. In Europe, Ireland, didn't have, Ireland had a floating exchange rate, but Ireland took on a fixed exchange rate. It joined the euro, basically fixing its currency to the German currency, the German mark. Okay? So an uh, increase here in countries with the fixed regime, and a decrease in the con similar decrease with the floating. And we have managed in the middle. So let's just uh, check our understanding and discuss with our partner. Uh, which are the three main currency systems? And what is the difference between main difference between the systems? So just what are the three main systems in the world that currencies have and what is the difference between them? Tell me first of all, what are the three three exchange rate systems? What are the name of the three systems? Can anybody tell me? Floating, managed, paid. Right, floating, managed, and paid. What's the difference between them? What's the main thing that is explaining the difference between them? Whether the government is involved. Involved in what? Okay. How does the government manage the exchange rate? Yeah. How do they do that? Right? They just join the market, right? They join all the other players in the market, and they start buying or selling the currency too. Okay? Uh, <coughs> to make the currency a certain level. Okay? So, which one is the government is more, most involved? Pegged, middle, and least? So another word is intervention. Intervention is the word we usually use, right? Do you understand intervention? Intervene? <coughs> Intervene means come in to the middle. So if you guys are fighting, I intervene. I come in and stop you from fighting. So uh, can you give an example of a country with a floating regime?
Japan, an example of a country with managed regime. China, example of a country with pegged regime. Hong Kong or Saudi Arabia, right? So, do, have you seen supply and demand graphs before? You understand about supply and demand and price? You've seen this. So the equilibrium is here, right? Where supply meets demand. So where does demand and supply meet? This is the price. Okay. So if we increase the demand uh, of a currency, that will exert upward pressure on the currency price. So is the currency going to get weaker or stronger? Stronger, right? So you should remember that. We increase demand for the currency, the currency gets stronger. Okay? What about if we increase, so it's the same, if we decrease the supply of currency, is it going to get stronger or weak, weaker? Decrease the supply. Decrease the supply is similar to increase demand, right? In both cases, uh, <coughs> the price, we increase the demand, the demand goes out here, and then we are uh, going to get a higher price for our currency, right? We decrease the supply, the supply goes back here, we're going to get a higher price for our currency here. Okay? So we should have seen this, we should understand that relationship from another class. Right? Most people have studied that before, about supply and demand. Increase demand, price goes up. Okay? Makes sense. Decrease supply, price also goes up. Okay? When a price goes up for the currency, what vocabulary do we use? How do we say price goes up for a currency? Get stronger or appreciate. You can also say appreciate. But most people say get stronger or get weaker. <clears throat> okay, on the other side, what will happen if we decrease the demand? Nobody wants our currency. Going to get stronger or weaker? What if we increase the supply? We print a lot of our currency. Stronger or weaker? So here we can see decrease the demand. This is the demand line. Then the price goes down, right? Increase the supply. Where does supply meet demand? Here. Price also goes down. Okay. Do you have any questions about that? What should the central bank do if it wants its currency to be weaker? So in Japan, they had an earthquake. Currency is too strong. What should they do? Increase the supply. Yeah. Decrease the demand. Why? Which is easier for them to do? Decrease the demand or increase the supply? Increase the supply. Why? Increase the supply. They can turn on the printing press, right? <laughs> press on. A lot of notes come out. Why? What about the other banks? That's called quantitative easing. Other central banks already have yen. They have savings in yen, right? Central banks have in their safe a lot of different currencies. So they're going to take their yen out of the box and sell it into the market. That also helps to increase the supply. Okay? <clears throat> so what can affect changes in demand? First one. Uh, short-term interest rates. So, do you want to buy a currency which has a high interest rate or a low interest rate? If you're an investor, do you prefer a high interest rate or a low interest rate? You're investing money. If you go to the bank, and Shinan Bank has a 4% interest rate, and uh, non your bank has a 3% interest rate. Which bank are you going to invest your money in? Non hop, you prefer non hop, even though it gives 3%? Shinan gives 4%, non hop gives 3%. Shinan, of course, you get 4%, right? So it's similar with invest, a little bit similar in the short term with investors. So 
if we give a higher interest rate in the short term, more people are going to want to buy our bonds or our currency. Okay, invest money in the in our bank, get a higher interest rate. So interest rate can affect demand. Do you understand the interest rate? Yes. Who decides the interest rate? Central bank. Central bank, right? They can raise the interest rate or lower the interest rate. That's the interest rate at which they lend money to the banks, okay? To the private banks. Uh, rates of inflation. Low inflation results increase the demand, okay? Why? Low inflation results in high real returns on financial assets. If I buy, I'm, I have euros, right? I buy a Japanese yen. Next year, Japanese yen has very high inflation. I change back to euros. Probably the Japanese yen got weaker, so I'm going to get less money back. So people prefer low inflation, low inflation currency. Economic growth rates. This affects long term. When people are investing, when you're doing your technical trading on a Wanda, that's mostly people copying each other, thinking about the short term, following trends, right? But if we think about the long term, we think about economic growth rate. If I think about the long term, right? Where, where am I going to invest? Should I invest in US stocks or in stocks in Somalia? Maybe nowadays the stock in Somalia is going up, right? I'm just picking a random country. But if I'm thinking about the long term, maybe the economic growth is higher in the US, okay? So I might decide to invest in the US. I think they have good economic growth rate, they have good uh, universities, good research and development. They have some good innovative companies. So I guess it might be a better long-term investment. Okay. So financial assets like stocks. A lot of people like to invest in the US stock market, for example. Changes in global and regional risk. Safe haven effect. We mentioned in the last class. Uh, during the period of uncertainty or crisis, the people will look for some safe haven, some safe place to put their money, where there's not much risk. So demand for the German bonds, demand for the US bond, the Swiss bond will go up. These things affect demand. The central bank can mainly can control this in the short term, interest rate, right? There's a little bit of a problem here. If we put up the interest rate, we might be affecting our economic growth rate, okay? So here is the safe haven effect. Do you remember September 11, 2011? What were you doing on that day? You were crashing into the tower? I didn't know it was you. Are you admitting for the camera? Could be in trouble. How did you survive? Did you jump out just before it hit you? So what were you doing on September 11? 2011. Can you remember? We were ready to go to school. Getting ready to go to school. Mm -hmm. I was at my graduation, undergraduate graduation, it was on the same time, same day. So here we can see uh, this is appreciation against the U.S. dollar. So we can see that when this is the plane. At this time, the plane crashes into the tower. Here we have a currency, uh, Swiss franc. So uh, it's getting Swiss franc is getting stronger against the dollar. If the plane crashes into the U.S. trade center, are people going to buy U.S. dollars or sell U.S. dollars? Right. So you can see here, appreciation is getting stronger. Swiss franc got stronger uh, by a lot against the dollar, right? And the other currencies all jumped. So this also affects demand if something happens, there's some kind of crisis okay, in the short term. So then, uh, do you have any question about supply and demand so far? Yeah. 
So then let's finish there for today. Thank you. You can find this uh, CPT on the web page. Yes. Pass me the camera. Yeah.